Thank you. Um, I'm acutely aware that it's four o'clock, and I'm acutely aware that there might be some drinks afterwards. So hopefully this is going to be quite engaging, quite different, um, and hopefully quite contentious. We've got some big questions about the ethics of some of what we're doing as well, so please do engage. Um, and we've got some open questions at the end as well, over a, over a glass of wine, or if you want to keep connected. Um, so I'm Nathan from Atkins, the Digital Transformation Director for the UK and Europe. We are um, an engineering, design and project management firm, but we're now part of SNC Lavalin, so we're a lot bigger, about 55,000 people, we're global, we've got a capital arm, a two billion investment arm to do uh, effectively enabling and sustaining capital, and we've got an ops and maintenance business, and, a, and a now, thanks to some of the investment, we've got a true digital business. So don't think of us as the WS Atkins of old, we've changed, and hopefully some of the a couple of the projects we're going to talk about today can kind of exemplify that and pique some interest. Um, so I run a new business for Atkins that we're kind of trying to get the business and our deployed work to be digital by default. Um, you'll know us for some projects like, or maybe you won't know us for projects like, we asset manage the M25, we also operate the mobile data for the M25 with EE, we run the East Coast Main Line, we do the feasibility study for 5G rollout for the UK with DCMS, we run the ANPR network for home office. Uh, we do most of the technology at Heathrow. We'll talk about that in a moment, the facial and biometric recognition. We trial most of the government's autonomous vehicle projects. Um, and we have a portfolio in defence, security, and well, the more sensitive law enforcement agencies in central government. So we're quite a diverse organisation, and we're getting more diverse, which is unapologetic and deliberate. Um, I'm also fortunate enough to be on the advisory board of Bristol Robotics Laboratory, uh, Meridian, um, the organisation that's tasked with ad adoption and normalisation of autonomous vehicle networks, Sanger Bain, the global infrastructure firm, and have worked on the sector deals for autonomous vehicles, rail and artificial intelligence. And lastly, I'm part of the CBI's Digital Transformation and AI Ethics Committee. Um, so I'm quite a busy guy, but it's a lot of fun. Um, I'm absolutely honoured to be here today to talk to you um, about how we're hopefully bringing practical examples of transformation and innovation through the autonomous vehicle and Heathrow projects that we're choosing. And we've got a couple of themes here. I'm going to try and track these back to IoT. We think some of these things are sort of the precursor of IoT in action, and also AI, and AI challenging the role of keeping the human in the loop, both in design and development, but also deployment of some of the, the more autonomous, um, autonomous services. But firstly, a quick story. Uh, we're going to hear about a project called Ventura, uh, which is the government's first autonomous vehicle project that we project managed. Um, it's in Bristol. The most recent trial, which is the videos on YouTube, is of a first group bus, the Ventura, Land Rover, the Wildcat, and two Twizzies that are all in full autonomous mode. And when the trial was going, when the test was going on on the open road, we wondered why the vehicles was, were quite slow to engage. The scenario was the three vehicles were overtaking a bus. And the coding, that had been applied was the highway code and the coding that the developers had used, the, the scenario was of a British road user. And having interrogated the data, the vehicles were just being too polite. After you, no, no, after you, I insist. Is it clear? Well, I don't know, let me go and have a look. So we'd inadvertently programmed in kind of some British characteristics. So some of the feedback we had from government was, your cars are just too polite, Nathan. So we do need to kind of think about some of those inadvertent human factors as we, as we go through our work. Okay, so we know that there's a lot going on out there. Um, we're facing some fairly profound changes uh, in the world in which we live. We're now a globally connected economy, whether we want to or not. Last year saw a tipping point, over half the world's population are connected to the World Wide Web. So the genie's out of the bottle. AI is here, not yet unconstrained neural networks, constrained neural networks, we'll come back to that in a moment. But it's a really interesting and disruptive world in which we live. So for an engineering firm that's tasked with designing delivering, and now more, more recently, operating and maintaining some of the smart and connected infrastructure, we've got to tread very carefully around where we release Vanguard technologies onto the network. Um, so we're going to cover this discussion today looking briefly at Heathrow and the autonomous vehicle projects. Um, so welcome to PaaS. I don't know how many of you have flown from Terminal 5 and Terminal 3 outbound. This system is up and running. It's broadly... Um, facial and biometric recognition, and a CT scanning technology for your bags. So you don't need your, you need your passport, but you don't need your passport out, you don't need your phone out, and you can keep your shoes, belt on, liquids in the bags, etc. The idea is that it's a seamless experience as you walk through bag drop, security, and cross the border. It's outbound for now, 
inbound as the next phase, and then other uh, terminals and other airports. The mission for us, there wasn't about the technology. Heathrow's mission was to deliver a secure, effective, and digital first airport. So, and, and the sequencing here kind of changes all the time because, um, because it's a very agile approach we're taking. We're still developing for the internal terminal as well as other terminals, like I said. But we start with the maturity assessment, then trying to work out common data because there was data coming in from Border Force, Home Office, HMRC, airlines, Heathrow's own data, and, other, and open source data. So we had to structure a bit of that. Had to work out what the business and operational data was. So a very high level of security broadly meant a slower experience. And then we started to do intelligence-led profiling, so you can sort of try and mediate the right speed by which you're validating um, a, a, a passenger's identity. Um, we then wanted to try and really deliver a great passenger and people experience. Um, and that was constantly evolving as well because we were communicating a lot with users that if it's a bit slicker and a bit quicker to get through, we need to make trade-offs over how far we're interrogating your, your identity data. So it was a very sort of open dialogue. Um, digital first operations are now um, in play at both those terminals. And again, that's now enabling us to design smarter infrastructure, different lane length, lane width. And finally, for the um, expansion program, the new runway, more intelligent construction, and all of this stuff will become the norm. Um, I'll just dwell on this for a moment. This is now the new user experience at, at Terminal 3 and 5. And essentially, it starts with you at home, on the sofa, registering on the Yoti app. The Yoti app a partnership we have with, uh, with the supply chain is deliberately not um, home office, border force, HMRC, security services, for a whole range of very understandable reasons. It's accessible, it's quite intuitive, and you load, amongst other things, your personal data, your face, and your retina. That's then scanned against those agencies' databases to make sure you're not a person of interest, that if you owe HMRC three and a half million quid, why are you flying out at six o'clock tomorrow morning? They might not want that to happen. But those are all indicators. So we're giving the airport the intelligence up front so we can start to support the airport to understand how long it should keep people in certain areas and certain zones. You get to the airport, your bag drop, you don't need a passport, you don't need your, your phone, you just put your face and retina up. And of course, it's validating you against data that was, unlike your passport photo, maybe 10 years old, five years old, this might have been taken five days ago, and it's been pre-checked. You then go through to your ticket validation, same principle, N hands in pockets at this stage. So nothing's come out. Um, again, it's a validation of retina and, and face. And it's, bank it's building on the data that's been banked. Um, security, again, same principle and bag check. The bag goes into the CT scan, laptops inside, no need to remove belts, liquids, etc. And again, another further validation of face and retina. So hands are still in pockets, if you wish, at this stage, and you're straight through. I, uh, on the, you can see the 3DS one there, number four. Identifying passengers and screening according to risk. A lot of the pre-analysis of the risk profile of a passenger has been done in the back office, and it will have sent triggers as soon as you've registered your, your retina and face. Government doesn't like to use the term profiling, but that's what it is, and it's very security-driven. So again, we can pull some levers with the airport here. So if we, have, if we have enough intelligence on a group of passengers or a demographic, then we can keep the dwell time and interrogation of that, of that passenger in terms of their authority to fly in a secure, in a controlled area. Then finally, ticketless boarding straight through to the gate. I don't mind sharing with you, that sounds great, by the way, to some, I don't mind sharing with you that it's caused a few problems we get people through too quickly. So we've now got congestion at the gates. We've got the retailers saying, but Nathan, you're getting through the retail, the sweet spot of the airport too quickly, which is tricky. So then you start to work out, so what's the optimal speed and dwell time do we need for the, um, the, that we need for the airport and that the airport needs for its, for its passengers? One intervention we've done with some of the retailers that will ping you a value message. So if we, if we know that you're drifting out of the retail zone, you get a, you know, here's 20 quid off if you spend 50 quid at Dixon's, but only for the next 30 minutes to try and get some of those levers to keep you in the retail zone. But you know what? We're learning as we go, and with heavy consumer engagement, we're trying to develop something which suits the airport, suits the security services, suits the airlines, and also suits the passenger. So what? Um, well, we think and we hope that we're doing a lot of the checking and validation to make the airport safer and more secure right up front. So we're, protecting the, we're helping protect the grey area of the airport so that it's before you get to bag drop um, and in between the, um, the short stay car park, the, the, the nearest car park, that's known as a grey area, a high risk area for airports. 
the car park's relatively surveilled, as you can imagine. The gray area isn't, and obviously bank drop is. So this is giving a little more of a, a leading indicator. Um, it's a faster boarding process, a bit too fast at the moment, but we're working on that. Um, we are actually helping the right person get on the right aircraft, and in some cases, the right person and family turn up to the right airport. So there is something about you know linking in and making a, better, a more expansive user experience w without just a security premium. Um, it's also helping the airport and the airlines make timely decisions, um, and the and and the um, and the retailers make timely decisions about where they want to target certain proposals to consumers. Um, and lastly, minimal interactions, reduced friction with um, what, as we all know, can be quite an invasive and disruptive security process. Um, so we're getting it more wrong than right. Uh, it's a learning process for us. It's slightly different to Manchester. It's a bit different to Schiphol. But we hope that the software that we've developed with our partners and the whole process, um, whilst we've invested a lot of time getting it to link in and align with um, Home Office, HMRC, and Border Force data and databases, is going to be resilient enough and enjoyable enough that we can see it roll out at, um, at different airports. So, you know, an Atkins project that is built on our construction heritage and engineering heritage at Heathrow, but puts us into a bit of a different space. Um, autonomous vehicles, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening in autonomous vehicles. Um, what we're really seeing, kind of three big messages have come up there. The physical, digital, and commercial ecosystems are all converging. It's not really about testing an individual vehicle anymore that can drive around a block without a driver. That can be done. Whether or not it's insured or safe or going to make the ethic ethically the right decisions in an event is now where we're fixing our time. Uh, data and cyber and connecti connectivity are now the grand challenges. So it, vehicles like this don't need 5G. They just need AG. So whether or not we put 3G and make it exclusive for, uh, for autonomous vehicles or 4 or 5, there's a big debate at the moment and a big study about what the right sort of triage is for that. Um, but they will get these vehicles if we think it's the right thing to be more universally adopted, as will be the commercial models. I don't see, um, but I'll be delighted to be proven wrong, that automotive manufacturers will be the big providers of mobility in the future. I suspect it'll be the account holders, whether that's software or service holders, that mobility will just be a provision and the vehicle will almost be an afterthought. Um, and the ethical and human factors is, ma is profoundly important to us. We test most of our, where we test on the open road, it's late at night and, and with stewards and a closed off area with the police. When we test on the test track, seeing what unconstrained neural networks can make a vehicle do and the decisions it makes are quite exciting and also quite alarming. So we need to be really careful about what we let out of the test environment into the real world. Um, we're going to very quickly talk about two projects, Ventura and Flourish. Ventura finished last year, Flourish is finishing this year. Ventura was the government's first, which we're delighted to get accepted as the, um, the lead partner on, and then also Flourish. In a nutshell, Ventura, three years long, five million pounds. We've got a consortium that we pulled together, quite a, quite a diverse consortium. This first with their bus that was talking very politely to some of the Williams vehicles and obviously the, uh, the BAE systems, Wildcat. Um, based in Bristol, ran for three years, really looked at the human factors. So how do we feel as users when the vehicle says to us, I'm going to take control or I'm going to hand control back? And how do we feel about putting children in an autonomous vehicle and booking it for them? And also, how do other road users, when you're not in an autonomous vehicle, feel about getting undertaken or overtaken by an autom autonomous vehicle? What the Americans call the freakout factor. So we spent a lot of time looking at the freakout factor. A really cool project to work on. What did we achieve? Well, we didn't choose the vehicle that we inherited as part of the project. The Mad Max looking vehicle isn't probably the, the, the best way to start to get user engagement. But goodness me, it turned the eye and, and kind of caught the head um, and, and caught the mind. Um, one of the big fields of study was to increase the knowledge of what two or 300,000 of these vehicles on the UK road network does to the road network and does to us as, as society. And there's a really important factor there about work displacement, us trusting autonomous vehicles at scale. If it's a bus route, or like at Heathrow, the, 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 the cabs that we run at Heathrow, where they go point to point, you might feel more comfortable. If it's around the streets of Bristol late at night with my kids in, I don't know. So you know, th th There's not one autonomous vehicle scenario. There's a bunch of different scenarios that we try to trial. Um, we've also done some work that's enabled a regulator draft regulatory framework and some draft legal positions on, on, on the legalities 
an insurance position for autonomous vehicles. And we've effectively boosted the Southwest economy as a bit of a home with Bristol Robotics Lab for, for autonomous vehicle testing. Flourish is the second one. It's in the news yesterday and today. Jesse Norman was down at the Flourish project launching our latest set of findings. Again, three years, five and a half million pounds, southwest of England, a similar consortium. This project looked at two really cool areas, I think. Rural based old age pensioners to give mobility back to them as a case study. And then some say quite an interesting but scary concept of a vehicle rules engine, which is the brain of the vehicle, the, the, the decision making engine which has got the ethical component in, or coded in, but also the network rules engine. So as we get into an autonomous vehicle and give control to the vehicle, which, we, we, which we've done in the test scenarios, when the vehicle goes onto a network that's got effectively a central controller, the vehicle cedes control to the network. So effectively the air traffic control system for, for Highways England or the highway network would then control 100, 300,000 vehicles. That's a completely enormous moral and ethical leap from individual vehicles and in turn that's a leap from going from non-autonomous to autonomous vehicles. So that's the field of study that we've had to tread very carefully um, and we're really pleased to see government invest in AI and digital ethics committees to help us and others try and, um, try and pave that route. Um, again, an iterative process where we do more complex tests and trials and again the uh, 2018 and 19 trials, the simulator and pod trials really look, um, working together as a, as a network, a small scale network of vehicles where the vehicles cede control to the network. Quite a cool consortia there, AGK, AIMSUN, universities as well are really important. So again, a really, you know, hopefully an, an interesting field of study, not about the vehicle, not about getting front page news on, on um, what car or something, the, you know, the greatest, auto, or the next latest autonomous vehicle to come out. This is about the re responsible deployment of vehicles using some, some pretty vanguard technology. So kind of the point I wanted to make from both those projects is the easy bit is up on the right. It's the autonomous vehicle. And I didn't mean to belittle the automotive sector. It's profoundly complicated to get the vehicle to drive around this car park without a human in. But if you can hack into it or you freak people out or you don't, you don't build safety into the trial design, which then teaches the vehicle how to behave, we haven't got the right infrastructure, or we haven't tested the human reaction to being in or next to an autonomous vehicle, or we haven't thought about what the world is gonna look like, so much narrower lanes, no need for speed limits, lane segregation, or not, um, it's a very different world. If we haven't really thought about what's gonna happen when we connect my device, my handset, to my vehicle, to the network, to buildings, and at what point is that going to end? So we need to be really aware about that ma mass connectivity. Um, if we haven't got the right digital infrastructure in place, whether it's 3, 4, or 5G, um, you can have all of those in place. But if no one's going to pay for it, we haven't got a commercial model, it won't fly. It'll go nowhere without legal standards and regulatory frameworks. We need to be dutiful about where we deploy constrained AI, let alone unconstrained AI. And frankly, we need to measure and monitor these vehicles and their performance. Um, so all of that recipe, and that's probably not in the right order, you could put them in almost in any order, all of those enable an autonomous vehicle fleet to operate at scale. And for me and for Atkins, it's the stuff underneath the vehicle that we find uh, most interesting, where we want to spend our time, where we deploy our innovation and, and, and transformation efforts. So whether or not we want to do them now, or in the sunshine, or later, um, some discussion points. So what do you think is happening as a result of a greater proliferation of connectivity, one of the themes we've touched on. How important do you think humans are as AI gets more and more accomplished, more and more intuitive and human-like? And, and human Does that make us less important or perhaps more important? I frankly think more important. Um, and perhaps the, the killer question for me coming from an engineering firm, we need to be really careful once we unleash a particular scale and type of artificial intelligence on the power network, the water network, the utilities network, the vehicle network, law enforcement, defence network. I suspect it's going to happen. In fact, beyond question, it will happen. When and how and with what safeguards are areas that keep me awake at night. Um, look, that's less than half an hour. I think that's probably a good thing. That brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope it's piqued some interest. I hope it's going to cause a bit of debate, either now or over a glass of wine or over LinkedIn or whatever. But Thank you for your time, and I'd be delighted to take any immediate thoughts or questions or, or comments. But thank you for listening.
change the decision making of a vehicle. It, you know, so I, and I think a little story about this myself, and, and <coughs> we really get to the final answer. But you know, when you're put in certain positions with human outside the car, humans inside the car, an inevitable outcome, the choices that that vehicle is going to make for you as a human being, um, what what kind of things are, are happening around that space? The coding that's plugged into the, the that's programmed into the vehicle is the British Highway Code, uh, and then because we're using it in a test environment, what are we, socially accepted norms, and that was that point I made about the kind of cars being a bit British and polite. It's an ethical and problematic, but inevitable minefield that we need to go into around what what choices the decision makes once the point of adopting uh, adhering to the Highway Code has passed. So if it if it realizes it's about to crash into something, it's or someone, it's got a range of evasive actions, and it can evade the person to injure the. In I mean, this is this is a well, a well-known debate, and it's it's and highly I, problematic. I was just wondering how you're approaching it. Myself, but it's like, you know, you, you behave differently, don't you, when you are driving yourself in the car or you're driving your kids in the car? When if you have to make choices, and then yeah. those choices are taken away from you, and, well, it, and I know it's. Really expensive. You can I mean, it is it is literally the million or billion dollar question. You can have a whole conference on this. We've run scenarios with you know we try to understand. Or government asks us, what's the mood of the driver? Well, that completely depends what I'm listening to, where I've just been, what time of day it is. Um, so there might be a thousand different moods in any one journey and a thousand different scenarios. Um, so you kind of need technology to help process those scenarios very quickly. But then if you rely on technology, you kind of trust it to make the right decision. But what, you know, what I think is the right decision, what you think might be different. It's so complicated. And I, th I suspect, this is Nathan's personal opinion, is that we'll see autonomous vehicles in some form of segregated uh, environment or some form of you know, defined environment rather than in you know, Bristol city centre, which isn't, isn't built for them. You know, autonomous vehicle lanes, perhaps, or autonomous vehicle routes, or times of day. That's a great question. <laughs> a long time on that song. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, for, for that one, wait, you, know, you mentioned that you're in the, the committee, is it, of ethical the discussions? Yes, the it, CBI. If we want to engage more in those kind of conversations, so I look after the trade inside of things, and with actual humans, we do a lot of monitoring mm. in terms of market abuse and, and uh, insider information, etc. It becomes quite an interesting discussion when you start looking at AI and decisions that are How, how can we have, sort of, as an industry, engage in So, the, so there's a slightly sort of two-part sort of response to that. Um, the, the, the lens of vehicles is only one lens. I think the debate is the same for um, uh, autonomous weapon systems in the military, autonomous health, uh, and I don't mean automation. I mean ab true autonomy. So uh, a, a, a robotic surgeon making a decision and then performing the operation based on that decision rather than just performing an operation. Uh, financial services and trading, um, vehicles. Same debate, but with, if you like, a different front end on it. Um, the government's AI ethics committee is publicly accessible. They've got an email, I think. Well, I know they've got an email, the uh, portal that you can go through. The CBI board um, is quite new. Um, I know the CBI has a membership structure. But I'm uncertain whether or not your your body is a member of it. But I mean, it's it's very easy to ask or ask me, and I can ask. I think you know. I think I have to say one thing. I have learned, which I find really refreshing, is there is a sense of no one knows the answer. There are degrees of experience and knowledge, but I, I would certainly not profess to be an expert, and I'd advise no one to put themselves up as an expert. And I think it's right that as society, we're kind of feeling our way together. Um, so I think probably yeah, the, the the AI. Uh, the government AI committee and the CBA committee might not be bad places to start. <laughs>